Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Culture Cast. I'm Chris Stash, and I'm joined by my two friends. Obviously, joining me once again is the host of the Projection Booth Podcast, your friend and mine, the one and only Mr. Mike White. I have nothing clever to say this week. I don't have to call you honey. <laughs> yeah, nothing nothing as clever as last week's bombardment of bullshit at the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> with you guys going off on Jimmy Cagney. And also joining us. Normally it's the three of us talking about dreams for sale, but he's here from a dark destination, as one might say, to join us. Our good friend and yours, Father Malone. Uh, good evening, H- honey? Oh, God. <laughs> Fucking Christ. Hey, Father Malone, kind of something weird. I think since the last time you were on this podcast, your namesake actually passed away. It's kind of weird. My namesake? Oh, oh yeah, I bet. No. Well, as it turns out, he had been uh, he had been dead for some time before uh, before the actual announcement. But yes, uh, certainly, the mantle is now mine. <laughs> I took it from. <laughs> Wait, what? I, I took wow. it from. <laughs> yeah, man. I listen. I took it from. Uh, I took it from sixty minutes, Mike Wallace, and now I took it from Hal Holbrook. Uh, <laughs> I'm the last man standing twice. Oh my god. Well, I thought you were going to say you went to his grave and like took it from him like this is mine. Ghost of Hal Holbrook. Uh but yeah, Hal Holbrook mm. died, which sucks. Um, he did. He did. Yeah, yeah, my my flippant attitude does not reflect my feelings on Hal Holbrook <laughs> and his say, and his legacy. Let me just I was say about that. To say, friend of the Kolchak tapes. I, we haven't talked to Mark Dewidziak in forever, but I'm I can't even imagine cuz he was friends with Hal Holbrook, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So. But Hal Holbrook, great actor if you had never seen him before in things. He's an uh, amazing actor. I also did a really good Mark Twain, right? That's kind yeah, of what he, he was straight. known for now, more he, recently. He played Mark Twain longer than Samuel Clemens did. <laughs> that's, right. Yes, that's that's always the joke. Uh, but we're not here to talk about Mark Twain. We're here to talk about some more Mike White March with another film. And this one actually features Joan Blondell. So we got our wish from last week, the next week. Which goes to show how far ahead we're looking. We're talking about three on a match. You, Vivian. I've done everything in my power to make you happy. I try to give you everything you ask for, let you do as you please. No, it isn't you. I don't know what it is. I just seem fed up with everything. No, but seriously, dear, there must be some solution. Can't we get together? Now, look here, Mr. Kirkwood. I'm butting into something that's none of my business. I don't know what happened between you and Vivian, and I don't care. But I do care about your little boy. Where are they? At the Warwick. She's registered under the name of Mrs. Kilroy. Just one more, darling, and then you'll have to dress. That's right. Mommy, I'm hungry. Is Mama's little honey bunch hungry? Here, have some of those. I don't like those anymore. Can I have bread and milk? Well, I'll call your bluff, Mr. Kirkwood. If you make one move against my wife or me, I warn you, I'll break every bone in your body and then throw you in jail. Now get out. And it was such a terribly important matter that I told Junior we ought to stop in our way and ask Daddy about it. I'm sure that was right, Miss Wesker. You've got to find him, I tell you. You've got to find him! So, Mike, before we start talking about the film, why did you pick Three on a Match? And this is another one where I culled through a lot of lists of best of pre-code films, and this title just kept coming up. And it's also a familiar phrase, and I was glad that they addressed the phrase in the uh movie itself. I was afraid I was going to have to like start digging through my old timey books and look for the whole explanation about not lighting three cigarettes on a match, but luckily they did it for us. Was this the first time you'd seen the film? First time, yes. I had never seen this before. What did you think? I really enjoyed it. I had a really good time with this one. I enjoyed it so much that I actually even went and watched the remake of it called Broadway Musketeers from 1938 
which had um, the lovely Ann Sheridan in it, directed by John Farrow, who I like a lot from The Big Clock. And yeah, it was all right, but it didn't have Bogart. It didn't have Joan Blondell. It didn't have Betty Davis being completely wasted in the film. Like, really, they don't need to... Like, it's, it's the title, right? Three on a match, and then you got the Musketeers and the other one. But they really only need to focus on two women in this. We really don't need the third one. Father Malone, first time watcher as well? No, uh, I had shown this movie... Uh, back in the early 90s, when I was a projectionist, uh, I, uh, uh, I worked for a, it was a Humphrey Bogart film festival, but it was sort of his lesser known, um, roles. Uh, and this, this was one of them. Um, so I had seen it before. I kind of had forgotten about it, uh, but was very excited to rewatch it because, um, I'm a huge Joan Blondell fan. So I, uh, uh, was very excited to watch it, but, um, I did not like it. Uh, I, I remember, uh, you know, I remember while watching it, my initial feeling was that, you know, it's 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 okay. It is what it is. But um, overall, not my favorite Mervyn Leroy film. Hmm. What is your favorite Mervyn Leroy film? Uh, I, I mean, the one I watch most is Gold Diggers of 1933. That's, you oh. know, which he made the next year with Joan Blondell. So right. that, uh, th- that to me is just endlessly entertaining. It's a great, great movie. I can say that I did not expect Father Malone to say, not my favorite Mervyn Leroy film on this podcast, uh, <laughs> which is totally fine. I just, I guess I didn't, I didn't know where you kind of were coming at this month from Father Malone, so... Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I like, you know, I, I love Joan Blondell. So ultimately, like, I'm going to like the movie just because she's, she is such, uh, uh, an amazing talent and one of the most underrated actresses of all time. I think if you go to YouTube and watch my, my video about, uh, Gold Diggers of 33, uh, I'm, I, I speak pretty glowingly about her. Um, but, uh, I you don't know, think I mean, Chris I, has I'm, ever I'm, seen Gold Diggers of 1933. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, have you seen the Gold Diggers of 1933? I have not. And you know what else I have Son of a seen bitch. And I'm not going to get to see. Because you didn't mm. pick it for September. I'm not going to get to see Stay Away Joe. That is true. You're not. Yeah. Wh- Joan Blondell and a, what was that, Mike? A song about an impotent bull? That's right. Dominic the Impotent Bull. That, that's true. Uh, yes, I, I chose that because it uh, it it's only good in a campy kind of derisive way. I wanted to focus on <laughs> Elvis movies that I really like. <laughs> I mean, it just sounded great, but it was mm-hmm. so funny because you had like, you had made a point when we were talking about that list to be like, this is, I don't want to watch this one. And then it came up organically on the last podcast. And I mentioned, I was like, yeah, father Malone didn't want to watch the movie about the bull. Uh, probably had to, to do with more of the fact that Elvis is in Brownface. Less the bull. Um, and uh, Burgess that's Meredith t- that's tied to it. Too. Yes. But, you know, back to this movie. Uh, it was good. I liked it. Uh, it was definitely a little different than last week. Uh, no characters strung out on a, a drug. What what drug it is, I do not know. But a a drug? We didn't see drug addict characters in the last couple movies, so that was kind of weird. Mm-mm. And suicide, so yeah, one right next to the other. I think yeah, same character. Jesus. Yeah, exactly. But I, I mean, did, I, I don't, you know, I, I just there was this thing about this pre code movie. Like, what drug was she supposed to be on? It seemed like heroin. heroin. Okay, because yeah. that's kind of what I thought. But like, I guess I just didn't know how prevalent heroin was in 1932. Oh yeah. Don't discount how long drugs have been around, for sure. <laughs> I was under the impression, and I was told, that the drug war was supposed to be over in 2019. And it's 2021, so no more illegal drugs. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yes, now. and all people who were brought up on drug charges have been let out of jail. So we're <laughs> also, good with that. Also factually accurate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's I, you know it has a drug addict. It has child kidnapping that ended up factoring into this movie getting delayed or they were kind of like you know maybe we don't want to show this movie because of the Lindbergh kidnapping uh Uh i I thought it was fun you know it's not like fun in like a exciting way but it's fun in like a kind of a sad story where you don't know where it's going and there's 
elements of danger to it. So you have these three women, uh, Mary, Ruth, and Vivian, and one of them becomes insanely successful and is married to a rich lawyer man. This is Vivian. And the other two, one is an actress, and one is not? Yeah, I'm not sure what Ruth's <laughs> right? profession is. Eventually a nanny for the child, but I, guess a yeah, I don't know what she's doing point? at the beginning. Yeah, she definitely no, they said, yeah, they said school. school. Yeah, because she said that she wanted to go into trade school and learn to, to have a skill. Yeah, and so Vivian and her husband have a kid, and Vivian is getting sick of her home life, so she goes away on a boat, and she just happens to run into her other friends who she did meet earlier in the movie, where they light the cigarettes off the match, and she falls in love with a gambler, and her life falls apart because she meets a gambler on the boat. Lyle Talbot, Lyle Talbot, who was who was in like three hundred and thirty two things listed on IMDb. This guy was very prolific, and I know I've seen him in a bunch of stuff. Mostly, I recognized him by his voice because he's got a great, great voice. Yeah he he has that look to him where you understand why and Dvorak's character like falls in with him. But then you also understand why he's not who he really ends up being. Because she falls in love with him thinking he's some, like, garish, you know, ne'er-do-well. And he's kind of not. Like, he falls in with, you know, Ace and ends up owing him money. And, you know, does some really nefarious shit to try to pay it back. But he's not this good-looking guy like her husband is. Her husband is like a, I guess, a generically good-looking 1930s man. He's got such a distinct look to him. This is William Warren we're talking about, who, again, I've seen him in a bunch of stuff, and that profile, you cannot forget that profile. You could, you know, cut a piece of paper on that nose, man. It's fantastic. Yeah, he uh, he would show up the, the next year also in uh, Gold Digger 33. Uh, really great character, actor, um, uh, and I believe the inventor of the first riding lawnmower. Oh, wow. That's a fact. Yeah. And he died pretty young if memory serves he only only lived like what 50 years something like that it wasn't very long i looked him up earlier and i was like oh wow this guy had a pretty short career and thus in a short life as well it's funny you know you you bring up like how prolific some of these actors are i mean you go back to any um uh anyone who sort of started out in the 30s and they just worked them like crazy and it always makes me laugh when I, i see an actor nowadays who you know did two movies a year for a couple of years. And like, I'm so burned out. And I'm like, you fucking, <laughs> you would not have survived in the studio system where it was like literally a movie every other week. 10, 10 movies is what Lyle Talbot did in 1932. <laughs> yeah. A lot of actors get cred for doing what? Two or three a year. Two yeah. a year is a big deal now. I mean, look, the production schedules are different and everything. Sure. But like, to Father Malone's point, like, the part that the actors have to do is is still s- similar. I wouldn't say the same, um, but similar. Uh, Warren William also played Perry Mason for the first time. Mm. So there's also that, uh, you know, uh, Perry Mason, a character made famous by HBO. Just kidding. Nobody watched that. <laughs> I mean, nobody like nobody did. And it's a fucking shame because the original Perry Mason is some good stuff. Like, the original show oh, yeah. and the movies from the 80s are really good. Um, but, uh, yeah, HBO not exactly putting the best foot forward. What's funny is when you look at Warren William, just him, like you said, Mike, from the side, he looks like the character on all the versions of Perry Mason books that I own. Like, oh, okay. The, like, the version of him on the cover looks kind of like Warren William. So it's kind it's kind of weird. But he his character in this movie, is he... Is he meant to be portrayed as a boring character or is Vivian as a character just not okay with her home life being so quote unquote boring, even though it's more secure than boring? Are we supposed to think that he's boring or just she doesn't get it? I think it's she doesn't get it. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, he, he okay. they, they kind of they portray him as like loving dad and, uh, 
you know, generous husband. I, for Christ's sake, when he notices that, you know, she's unhappy, she's like, I, I'd like to go away without you. And he's like, well, it'll bother me, but if that'll help. Like, yeah, yeah I don't, you know, I don't think that's supposed to come off like – He's sort of wishy-washy or anything. I, th- I think that's just another aspect of him being a really loving guy. So it's, I think he's there just to reinforce uh, how lost she is as a character. Yeah, and once he kind of switches horses in midstream and starts going out with Mary, she seems really happy to have him as a husband. Well, I mean, who wouldn't? Look at that guy. <laughs> I mean, he's a good-looking guy. I mean, yeah, I mean, you have a lot of... You have a lot of class and style with even the shittiest of characters in this movie with Lyle Talbot. Oh, you know, yeah. I mean, they're having a, a booze-soaked party in their fucking hotel room at one point. And if not for the fact that there was a child in this room with them, or I guess two <laughs> floors above them, um, I guess it is in the room with them, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. I mean, that would be a party you'd want to be at. But, like, you don't because you know that these people are, like, verifiably fucking insane. So, especially Vivian's character. I mean, it is it is shocking the progression how quickly her character goes from a normal, quote-unquote, normal person to just, like, completely, you know, drugged out of her mind. And what's funny is this movie doesn't feel like it's an hour long. Like, they get a lot done in the span of an hour in this movie. It's really impressive. Oh, yeah. Well, that they even have them as children. Right. And that whole opening scene of them. And, yeah, the way that uh, uh, Mary's kind of a fuck up. And then it's like, oh, yeah, she's going to go to reform school. And we even get a little bit of her in reform school. It's like, wow, where are we going with this? I mean, at least by midway through the first act, we have switched to the adult versions of the actors. But, yeah, this is moving at a really quick pace. That actually represented my favorite part of the movie, and I think this is actually attributed to Mervyn Leroy. We don't just get a title card that lets us know we're in 1919 and now 1925. He actually crafts little newsreel-type yeah. sequences yes. as a I reminder of each, you know, hey, remember what happened in 25? Remember what happened in 29? And uh, on top of that, because I thought that was really skillfully done, but – you know, it, it really did seem like as a reminder to the audience by giving us the, the sort of pertinent moments in those years. And to think that people were sitting in that theater and were reminded of, Oh, remember when women got the vote? Like, yeah, <laughs> we tend to think of that as, as always having been, but it's really not. It's, it's now just a hundred years old. Right. And that these people are sitting in the theater in 1932 and it's like, yeah, that was six years ago. Oh, that was five years ago. And this, that countdown to present day, I, I really did like that. It was a, it was definitely an interesting framing device that they used because we didn't really see that in any of the other movies we've talked about. All the other movies have been like taken place over like a, a couple days. Right. I mean, right. nothing has taken place over long periods of time. Even the divorcee was probably like, what, a couple months? If that. Yeah, I would say probably Blonde Crazy took a little bit of time, too, with all the the scams and the this and that and who's yeah. screwing over who. But yeah, the divorcee definitely took a while with all of the flights back and forth to Paris and London and all that. But it didn't have the it didn't have the audacity to try and introduce the original like children versions of the characters. And that movie's an 80 minute film. This one's yeah. 60. This is a 63 minute film. It's like, again, even if the movie wasn't the best film I've watched this month, you have to give it so much credit for just attempting so much on, on, on a very small scale. Yeah. I do think that one thing that I, cause I hate when movies go back and for one scene we get the children, but sort of what sort of padded the landing for that in this movie is the old Warner Brothers technique of giving us the, like title cards of the actors at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And in this case, they would show you the child first and then the adult version of them. Cause you know, usually when you go back to, to the, the children, you're scratching your head for a little while. Like, wait, who's this supposed to be? Who's that supposed to be? So, uh, I thought that was also like, uh, uh, very skillfully done. That was very nice. Yeah. I mean, it seems like the, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the, it seems like to me, the screenplay writer, Lucian Hubbard has, a little bit better of a wrangle on how to write something that does a little bit more than the films at the time were doing. 
and but still manages to tell a complete story because I was kind of surprised how quickly the film wrapped up at the end. At the end end, where, you know, all of a sudden you have the character of Vivian just losing her mind completely. But it, it, it works, even though it's sudden and you have everything escalating very quickly. I mean, it goes from they don't have money to how are we going to get the money to I'm going to blackmail you to I'm going to kidnap your fucking kid. And then we have to kill the kid because the cops are here. It's like, Jesus H. Christ. Like, this is escalated in the span of, like, 15 minutes, right? Oh, yeah. But it, it works. It just works. And it's surprising because I didn't I didn't expect to walk away from this film and go, the 15, 20-minute climax where everything seemingly happens shouldn't have worked this well, but it worked really well. It is interesting to compare it to Broadway Musketeers because it doesn't – that one doesn't start in – the distant past like you get a little bit it starts more in the present so but it, it works i think that they didn't necessarily have to do the the past stuff but it works in um in this film and that they didn't do it in the other film i was like okay that that kind of works as well um i have to say i really didn't mind the child actor in here i thought that it was actually kind of cute it reminded me a little bit of like spanky from our gang um and i haven't looked up who he is and what else he had done but i thought he uh did a pretty good job of reacting properly to stuff and you know it's especially there's one scene i'm trying to remember what happens but he like runs he's out of the room runs in the room runs out of the room and i was like wow he's pretty pretty good trained little monkey you got there yeah, I, th- I actually also thought he was Spanky for a minute, so I, I did look him up, and he's an actor who continued working uh, and in child roles for at least another decade. Uh, but I agree with you. I thought he was a really good performer. I think the only times I didn't enjoy it, it was because the script w- wrote him a little too preciously or precociously, mm-hmm. uh, but well, I thought he carried I it off really my well. Eels? Like, yeah, come yeah. the fuck on. <laughs> Even for you, this is too much child actor. <laughs> like, please. <laughs> I understand what you're going for, but this is too much even for me. <laughs> Cut that shit out. Come on. <laughs> Could I have some milk and some bread? Said no child ever. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, it's bread and milk. It's so, like, pathetic. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that was interesting that they, what is it, like, they aren't feeding him right, and so he's just like, you know, st- almost starving there. Yeah, like, yeah. It's like, I couldn't oh, even man. tell what the hell they were trying to feed him. Was that, like, a tray of fucking canapes or something? Here, basically, it's like, yeah. He, he, it's like she loses all mothering weirdo, abilities. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> You're having an olive, kid. It's from yeah, exactly. my martini. <laughs> so, uh, there's something we haven't mentioned yet. Humphrey Bogart is in this movie. Uh, yeah. My favorite, my favorite part of his appearance in this film is, uh, he, he comes to the guy's door after the kidnapping has happened. The, the other gang members have figured out that he's onto this and now they want a piece of it. And he knocks on the door and he's like, let me in, open the door. And he's like, who is it? And I'm like, all I can think is, clearly that's Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> right. <laughs> what is this man's name? Who is there this is, person? <laughs> there is no other voice that sounds like that. And yeah, he, is so young in this. I've never seen him that young. And just to think of like how fast his stock would rise over the next few years, it's just like, wow, that's amazing. And he, I mean, even in 1932 as a young man, he was just such a presence. It was so great seeing him and just, yeah, every time he was on screen, I was riveted. Every time he's on screen, I wanted him to be on screen more and everything else to just melt away. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, look, I'm going to, I mean, again, I, I, this should not come as a surprise to the listener, given that I've essentially said I these movies are not in my wheelhouse, but I have not watched very many Humphrey Bogart films. I would go out on a limb and say the only ones I can remember are The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. That's one that he's a- in, right? Damn good movie. Yeah. Okay. You might want to think about doing a Humphrey Bogart month next year. Yes, I, I definitely should because Jesus Christ, this movie could have just been him on screen for an hour and I would oh, have yeah. been okay with it. Like, he, look, that's the problem when you have an actor like Humphrey Bogart in something that's not his movie, right? You're just like, uh, can we get more of this guy who's in this one scene of the movie? Yeah, there's another film Joan Blondell did called Night Nurse, which is a a fantastic 
uh, thriller. And the, the killer in that film, who only has sort of a peripheral role as Clark Gable before he had done anything sort of major. Wow. So it's super jarring watching him. Like, he walks in the door, you're like, oh, well, here's going to be a major character. Like, nope, just here's a chauffeur. That's funny. Wow. That's fucking insane. You know, backing uh, Humphrey Bogart up in this movie is an actor named Alan Jenkins, who is another great character actor. Uh, it, it's funny to me that most of the actors in this, you know, other than Betty Davis, obviously, but most of these guys would do their best work in comedies. Um, Alan Jenkins had a presence of like being a huge kind of tough guy, but he's a really deft comedian. Um, there seems to be no end to the talent on screen here, but I, I do, I, I do agree with you guys. Like, you know, just seeing Bogart on screen, you just want to watch him. Like he had that it factor that, you know, is rare in actors. What is the Humphrey Bogart it factor? Is it the voice? Because for me, it's the voice. It's to me, it's the whole. That's part thing, of it. The whole package. Yeah, yeah. And what, you know what's funny, Chris? Because you and I watched for Culture Cast a Humphrey Bogart movie, The Dark Passage, and that's like the one Humphrey Bogart movie where he basically doesn't appear in it because it's a first person point yeah. of view film. I know. Right. <laughs> it killed yeah. me. It killed me. <laughs> I was like, wait, this is a Humphrey Bogart movie. Be sort of, kind of, yeah. I mean, once he gets the surgery, right? He's okay. Then you see him. Yeah, but that's the first half was, of it is just. Yeah. Oh yeah. All P- all first person POV. That yeah. scene of the surgery in Dark Passage always reminds me of uh, Batman when uh, they're doing the surgery. <laughs> Mirror the Joker. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh yeah. You see the tools I have to work with. I have nothing. <laughs> As opposed to the doctor in Dark Passage who's like, oh, good thing uh, I like you. I could make you look like a bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, he's he's really good in this movie. Like, that scene is so good that it does kind of take me out of the movie, which is a bad thing. Like, it makes me just go, hey, can I watch some Humphrey Bogart stuff on YouTube? Like, I obviously obviously didn't do that in the middle of the movie, but you, you guys obviously, you get what I made 100%. It's just like, like you guys said, like, you can't take him out of this. You can't take who he is out of this movie. It's fucking right. impossible. Well, it was nice seeing him make Lyle Talbot just squirm and oh, just yeah. how how tough he is. And Talbot's just like, oh, please don't hit me. You know, it's like, all right, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and like, that's the thing about Humphrey Bogart. He just was intimidating without having to do much. He doesn't, like, pull a gun on him or, like, pull up on him. He's just talking to him. And the guy's uh-huh. scared out of his mind. <laughs> like, that That alone is a lot. He's like, hey, go over to the fucking corner, see? Like, Jesus, yeah, fuck it. Okay, you're right. You're the boss. <laughs> fuck that shit. I, the the climax of this film is uh, is pretty batshit, right? That's yeah, a good word for it. I, <laughs> yes. I, I kept being reminded of Con Air. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I was, uh, yep. So for the audience, if you haven't watched this film, you have a character who she lost her child because her husband divorced her because she ran off with the child. And now the child has been brought back to her because he was kidnapped by her boyfriend's shark, loan shark. And they're going to kill the child now. So she has to figure out a way to save her child. So she tells him to hide under the bed. And she starts scrawling in lipstick on her nightgown where the child is. And then as she's about to be murdered by gangsters, she fucking hurls herself out of a window. Yes. It's fucking Nobody saw that coming. I I did did not. not see that shit coming. I thought she was just like putting on the lipstick and just like kept screwing it up and just kept putting on more just the way that she's acting all twitchy and stuff. And then when she jumped out, who's a pretty girl, who's a pretty girl. I was like, holy shit, what is happening? Somebody call nine one one. I must've watched it three times. I I, I kept rewinding like, really? (laughs) There there she goes. Yeah. And, uh, and again, for 1932, you would not expect to see the body hit anything, never mind, like, burst through. I- I'm assuming that was an awning before hitting the ground below. And then it's, the uh, it's pretty has hardcore. a line after she hits the ground. Because <laughs> my wife pointed it out. She was like, of course, of course she couldn't just die on the ground. She has to say, she goes, hurry. Like, what the f- You're dead as fuck. You're not just dead. You're smashed to fuck. You're fucking hamburger going through that plate glass window hurry get out of here (laughs) (laughs) 
It's wild, though, right? It is pretty wild. Yeah. Here's the pre-code shit I was looking for, Mike. <laughs> Here. <laughs> people throwing themselves out of fucking fourth-story windows. All I hopped up by now, H. And, I, yeah. yeah. My God. Yeah. About that, the, you know, the, I, I know that this is definitely in the spirit of pre-code movies, but this is a couple years after the Hayes Code went into effect. So, well, uh, went you know, into that, effect. that was 19... 19- yeah, we were talking about this last week. It went into effect in one year, but they really didn't start to enforce it until like 34. Yeah. 34. Right. From my understanding, this movie sort of made it through the censorship board because it was such a moral uh, uh, fable. And, you know, you mentioned at the top, Chris, about the, the Lindbergh kidnapping. Like this movie, it, it wasn't sort of coincidental that it got made this way. Like this was, they, they wrote this a couple of months after the Lindbergh case. And I think because it was a happy ending, such as it is, uh, <laughs> to, to that, to that story, like where the, the bad people got punished and the kids survived, that's how it squeaked through, um, the, the, the Hayes code. Um, I don't think if they had had the particular ending the way it did, where, where the, where the bad people get punished, uh, that it would have uh, flown at all because there's a lot of stuff in there that's you know pretty rough that uh, by then they were doing their best to excise. So can we, let's let's talk about this. This is something we kind of touched on a little bit, and Father Malone, you brought it up, and and Mike and Father Malone. I'm glad you guys are the ones on this podcast. D- like the morality of that is so twisted, right? And Mike, we've we've talked about this now a couple times. This idea that like, and I was guilty of it myself in Blood Money, but that was just because I fucking hated that character, but. Um, that the bad guys have to get punished and that somehow in this movie, somehow in this movie, the the kind of outcome that Anne Dvorak's character gets is somehow the right one. Isn't that fucked up, right? <laughs> or is it yeah. just me? Like, thinking that is an okay way to end the film and it mm-hmm. going through the censors is not okay. Well, it's it's twofold because she she gets punished because she's now right. dead, but she also does the right thing before that happens. So in their, in their twisted idea of morality, then it was okay. Yeah. I, I always, it, it, the, the, the Hayes code as it was, is always sort of laughable in that, in uh, the fact that as long as the bad guys get theirs in the end, that's okay. And if that includes them being murdered, well, all the better. It's, it is a crazy way to look at things. We'll endure any sort of degradation for the running length of the movie just so long as we sort of wrap it up with a don't let this be you. Yeah, yeah. You expect, like, the guy to come out at the end. We've just seen a very important story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I really did. Like, as she's plummeting, it freeze frames. And Rod Serling right. comes out and he's like, this story you've seen tonight could be on another night. In another part of this country, you could be hooked on <laughs> heroin. Like, oh my god, getting hooked on heroin and throwing yourself out of a window. She got what was coming to her, folks. Boy, did she ever get what she deserved. It's in fucking insane. Like censorship in the media is nuts, but like this, <laughs> like okay, so this was the bar that was okay. Heroin addicts throwing themselves out of windows. Got it. Yeah, and don't show people in the same bed, and never show a toilet. <laughs> Never show a toilet. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, was you weren't allowed uh, to show toilets for a long time. Yeah, Hitchcock broke that. In yeah, Psycho. big. It was a big deal. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I always, I always forget the thing about the toilet in Psycho. That was like the first movie that ever showed a t- flushing toilet. Right. Yeah, that's what yeah. they say. Yeah. Is that what IMDb? <laughs> what IMDb says? Is that Probably. what my copy of Blockbuster Movie Trivia from 1992 says? Did you know that? <laughs> probably it's that. probably not only is it on there, but it's probably on there like six times because yeah. they don't monitor the trivia. <laughs> oh, um, well, if Camp Rock has taught us anything, <laughs> the trivia on IMDb Mike is not monitored. No, no, because coincidentally, another film with a heroin addict. Apparently, yeah. So they apparently, go. yeah, apparently. Well, that's because heroin yeah. addicts are unreliable. <laughs> They write their own trivia. Yeah, except this one was downtown Julie Brown <laughs> as a heroin addict, so there you go. Not, not downtown, uptown. Uptown, right. Uh, sideways yeah. town, not not down. But <laughs> I think I, I, I liked this movie more than almost everything this month except for Blonde Crazy. Oh, really? I thought you liked Jewel Robbie better. 
Um, yeah, but I've been thinking more about jewel, like um, not jewel robbery, but blonde crazy. And I think I like the way Blonde Crazy wraps up more than Jewel Robbery. Hmm. So I've come like in the last week. I've, I've I, in the last week I actually rewatched Blonde Crazy, which is the only movie I've done this month. Rewatched it in the month, uh, and I nice. think I like I think I like Blonde Crazy the most. I mean, Cagney's performance. That's that's the thing. Also, it has essentially the performance that this film has with Bogart throughout the entire movie. So mm. it's almost it's almost unfair to have a film with someone as good as Cagney in the month because it's like, yeah, this is, you know, obviously this performance is going to shine above almost everything else, so. I can appreciate the fact that this was 32 and the Hayes Code was there and the movie is as rough as it is, but it did feel to me overall kind of a chiding uh, depiction of what women should be allowed to do. Uh, in the 1930s, you know, we've got the, the career gal who, you know, is basically just a secretary, the showgirl who gives it up because being a mom is a better role for you and a party girl who must die. So <laughs> ultimately, I don't really like the film for that tone watching it. Yeah, I mean, it goes by fast um, and like everyone's great in it and Vorak in particular, like. Going from sort of the, the sweet character we meet when we initially, when we're initially introduced to that iteration of her to how far she falls and how believable she is once she gets there. Um, that was pretty great. But, you know, in the end, this is probably not something I'm going to watch again. Yeah. I mean, it does have that <clears throat> kind of, you know, tongue clucking feel to it where it's like, this is drugs are bad. Like, yeah. You're going to sure. fall in with the wrong crowd. Yeah. And then that'll lead That's to right. losing your child and throwing yourself out of a fucking window where was humphrey bogart in that last scene was he not in that last scene i think he, he was, was in, in the, other, the room. other room yeah okay that's what i thought yeah. i'm just making sure because there was like another guy who looked really ragged that looked a lot scarier than humphrey bogart <laughs> that was like rushing at uh and dvorak's character i was like that is not humphrey bogart that is a very scary looking man not humphrey bogart um I think it was probably, oh, I don't know. I don't know which of the actors it was, but he had cool. like slicked back black hair and he was like coming towards the camera with these giant eyes. And I was like, oh God, like, <laughs> now that's the scary guy right there. That's the, that's the cool. one. Yeah. I wonder if that was Alan Jenkins. He does have a great look as well. And yeah, you're, you're right. Father Malone. I, I do recognize him much more from comedies than from being in uh, movies like this, but he had such a range. Yeah, I mean, he usually plays like the sort of lovable lug, you know? Right. And, uh, but, uh, obviously, if you m- want to make him menacing, he can excel in that too. Oh, yeah. You just got to light him from below, and all of a sudden those features just <laughs> completely monsterfy. Yeah. Holy shit. You're not kidding. Good Lord. Yeah. So, what would you give the film out of five, Mike? I'd probably give it like a 3.5 out of five. What about you, Father Malone? Two and a half. Yeah, I would, I would say a three is probably right where I'm at. It was good. It was a lot of fun. I think that the climax is kind of worth the price of admission. And again, it's 63 minutes. Like, you could watch almost anything in 60 minutes. Why wouldn't <laughs> yeah. you watch something like this? It, you know, introduce it, yeah, yourself to something you might like. Like, it's, it's definitely not something that's going to just be on Netflix. I think it still functions as, like, a pretty good curiosity as far as you know, from the time the Hayes Code came in until kind of the mid 60s, at least here in America, uh, everything became so squeaky clean that we kind of forget uh, like how sophisticated audiences were uh, Uh because they were denied that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That is all. Well, on that note, let's uh, play a preview for the final episode of Mike White March. And who's to blame? My father. A swell start you gave me. Ever since I was 14, months had been? Nothing but men. Dirty, rotten men. And you're lower than any of them. I'll hate you as long as I live. Oh, not here, 
somebody met. What could I do? He's my boss and I have to earn my own living. Are you letting me go? I'll need everything I've given you. All your bonds and securities. I can't do it. I have to think of myself. I've gone through a lot to get those things. My life has been bitter and hard. I'm not like other women. Get out of here or I'll... Millie, you've got to marry me. If you don't, I'll kill myself. right on the final episode of mike white march we are going to be talking about 1933's baby face we're going to be joined by trevor gumbel of the on Segal podcast and i hope i assume that it's going to be just as good as everything else i've seen this month so i'm i'm looking forward to it you're like a baby face <laughs> that's all i can think <laughs> of um, like your baby face. <laughs> so anyway how's your sex life <laughs> Oh my god. Oh my god. I was what the fuck? Was I quoting that when we were talking about Justice League? Yeah. Yeah. Cuz yes, they were talking were. about fucking Fl- the Flash's future wife. You're my future wife. <laughs> yeah, I give anything for my girl. <laughs> 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 oh my god. Oh, if you don't know what You know we're what quoting, they say, <laughs> love is blind. <laughs> It would have to be to be with Tommy Wiseau, okay? I mean, look, I'm no George Clooney, but Tommy Wiseau... And you're no Julio Iglesias either. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, Lord. Let let me just say, fellas, that uh, I did not know what you were talking about, but your impressions were so good (laughs) that I immediately knew we were talking about the room. (laughs) I mean, the best line in... The entire room is people are very strange these days. That's like Greg Sestero reaching out for help from, <laughs> from times before. He's like, if you could go back in time and get me off of this movie, you wouldn't because it's my thing now. I mean, yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, damn, making making your money off of a movie you claim to not like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Mm, mm. I'm not throwing shade, but it's just kind of fucking weird, right? They call that Roger Eberting. <laughs> yeah. Beyond the Valley of the Dolls is great, guys. What? No. Sure. Fine. Isn't that his, that's his movie, right? Oh, yeah. 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 That everybody- but then, you know, he published any number of books about the movies that he hated. Like, well, not enough to not profit off of them, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, boy. Well, our Tommy Wiseau impersonations aside, where can people find you when you're not here, Father Malone? You can hear me if you uh, uh, you can go to my website, fathermalone.com. I got links to everything I do, uh, particularly my podcast, Dark Destinations. It is a monthly radio drama that takes place in towns that don't exist. Um, you can also hear me over on Chronicles from the Crypt. Very, uh, very briefly. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's at coming least to in an its end. Current with... form. Yeah, I mean the the previous episodes are still there, but it is coming to an end. And as Mike, uh, not Mike, as Chris mentioned at the top, uh, you can also hear the three of us on Dreams for Sale, the Twilight Zone eighty five podcast. Though, as our friend Mike would say, soon to become Dreams for Rent. Dreams sure. for lease. <laughs> lease with an option to buy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! What about you, Mike? Where can people find you? You can find me at the Projection Booth Podcast, which is available at projectionboothpodcast.com. And you can also hear Chris and I talk about Barney Miller if you go to barneymillerpodcast.com. And, yeah, I guess that's about it. So that, and you already talked about dreams for sale, so we're good. They know about the dreams we're selling. Hopefully they will come and buy them. Oh, and I guess the Rankin on Bass podcast as well is what we do. Rankin on Bass. Rankin on Bass coming back for two months in a row of uh, podcast episodes. That's right. St. Leprechaun's Day? (laughs) (laughs) Boy, I fucked that one up from the launch. Just, I didn't, nope. We talked about leprechauns for St. Patrick. Just shit your pants and dive in and swim. (laughs) Yeah. 
<laughs> pretty much. Uh, as for me, you can find me here on the Culture Cast. Uh, we did a live video podcast. You can find that on the Culture Cast YouTube page. That is on YouTube. Just search Culture Cast. Mike and I and Josh Hadley of 1201 Productions. Yes. 1201 Beyond, I think, is what he calls it. 1201 Beyond. Uh, talked about the Snyder Cut for almost as long as the fucking Snyder Cut. You can find the live video on YouTube. You can find it in Mike's RSS feed over at the Projection Booth podcast as well. As for me, on Twitter, Christmas Claus, that's it. That's the only place you can find me. I'm on Instagram. You find me, you can add me. It shouldn't be that hard, but okay. Uh, and uh, as always, big thanks to our patrons. Big thanks to Mike and Father Malone for joining me. And we will catch you on the next episode.